The San Jose copper and gold mine has been worked for over a hundred years. Its labyrinth of tunnels and interconnecting ventilation shafts spirals down for nearly two and a half thousand feet. Jose and his team try to find a way below the collapsed access ramp by climbing down the ventilation shafts. I, I don't know how far down we got. Uh, minutes turned to hours. Uh, but we, we found a level where there were no cracks. The walls uh, seem sound. Jose thinks he's reached a tunnel below the collapsed section. But before a mission to rescue the miners gets underway, a second collapse crushes the ventilation shafts. The left wall was cracked completely. The ventilation shaft has completely gone. And levels 12 and 8 don't exist. Mining Minister Lawrence Goldborn is on site coordinating the rescue. That collapse meant that there was no way that we will make this rescue in a short period of time. Goldborn's only option is to drill six inch holes into the tunnels below the collapsed section. It's now the only way to make contact with the men, if they're still alive. The first of nine drilling rigs arrive at the site. Video cameras will be lowered down the holes to look for signs of life. Four of the rigs are equipped with slower diamond-tipped drill bits and five with faster hardened steel drill bits. Raul Dagnino is in charge of one of the high-speed drilling rigs. The big challenge on this is we need to drill fast because what we know is that the miners underground, they only have a few days to, to, to survive. After that, there is not going to be oxygen. The problem with the high-speed drills is that they drift off course when cutting through hard rock. The harder the rock, the bigger the deflection. Engineers must angle the drill in order to compensate for the deflection. But no one knows exactly how hard the rock is. They will need all their experience if they're going to hit the tunnels where any miners might be sheltering. After drilling down, over 1,640 feet, there is still no trace of the miners. Rescuers know the men only had enough food for two or three days. Hopes of finding anyone alive are fading. A makeshift camp where the miners' families have been living since day one is named Campamento Esperanza, Camp Hope. Carola's husband, Raul Bustos, is one of the missing miners. My husband is down there. I'm waiting here for him, and in Talcahuano, his children are waiting for him. He is strong. He will get out. Rescuers turn their attention to one last place, a refuge located in the deepest part of the mine. It's a long shot, but if the miners are alive, it's possible they're sheltering here. The tunnels around the refuge are only 15 feet wide and almost half a mile down. To drill into them, the engineers must reduce the normal operating error of their machines from 10% down to just half of 1%. It's an almost impossible task.
14 days have now passed since the mine collapsed. The lead drill is finally approaching the level of the refuge. But the hard rock causes the drill to veer off course. They miss their target by less than 100 feet. It's obviously a big disappointing for the crew, you know. We normally work for finding minerals, you know. We, we never drill to find lives. And you see all this big camp and everybody there, you know, people crying. It's getting critical. More days, less chances. We have to keep drilling until we, we hit the target, you know. By August 20th, rescuers fear all the men are dead. In the early hours of the morning of the 17th day, all nine drilling rigs are ordered to shut down. One of the rescue teams has broken through into a tunnel close to the refuge. Everyone listens. They hear something. As they are metallic tubes, somebody bangs down there and the operators above can hear them. That's why they stop the engines, so they can be certain they are receiving signals from someone. One of the miners is hammering on the end of the drill. Someone has survived for 17 days in the blackness. Six hours later, the drill is winched back to the surface. Rescuers find a note strapped to the end. We are well in the refuge, all 33 of them. It's news no one is expecting. All 33 of the missing miners are alive. A miniature camera and telephone cable are lowered down the six-inch hole into the mine. These are the first images of the miners broadcast to the world. Hello? Si, lo escucho. Yes, I can hear you. This is the head of the ship, Luis Ursua. Luis Ursua, you're speaking with the mining minister, Lawrence Goldborn. We're fine, waiting to be rescued. We are starting work on digging tunnels and chimneys. An emotional rendition of the national anthem reaches the surface. It's the last thing psychologist Alberto Etura expects to hear. We all expected the mood of the miners to be a depressing one, with severe mental problems. However, we realized they were healthy people. They are extraordinary people. The miners are not confined to the small refuge. They are able to move through over half a mile of tunnels in the lower part of the mine. The miners describe their desperation of the first 17 days. We hope to, to open a line of communication with the surface. We put lots of smoke signals through here. We set fire to oil filters and tires. It was a desperate time. 
To help the men cope with their prolonged isolation, the Chilean government calls in NASA psychologist Al Holland. It makes a big difference that there was a group of 33 down there. They divided up into work groups and they explored for water, they dug wells. This is extremely important because if people do not organize themselves and they do not take control of their fate, then they're essentially have given up before they've even tried and those people tend not to survive these situations. The reason for the collapse is still under investigation, but local mining engineers suspect that poor structural support is to blame. You should leave support bridges at different levels with a predetermined thickness, and in this case, there was one bridge which was mined. Instead of being 30 meters thick, at one point it was approximately 15 meters. Whatever caused the collapse, the result is clear. A 700,000 ton block of rock crashes down, crushing the access tunnel and ventilation shafts to a depth of over 1,600 feet. The miners are entombed under nearly half a mile of rock. A rescue at these depths has never been attempted. The reality is that these men may never see the light of day again. The miraculous survival of all 33 miners captures the world's imagination. The men are alive thanks to the actions of their shift leader, Luis Orsua. I can't wait for the minute I'll be together with all my family. He insisted they ration what little food they had. Each survived on just a sip of milk and one spoonful of tuna every two days. That was our first attempt at cooking in one of the drop filter colors. We made a little soup. Very delicious, by the way. But the rationing leaves their bodies close to collapse. Now the food they so desperately need could kill them. Too many carbohydrates can cause a sudden drop in phosphate levels, a chemical vital for maintaining a beating heart. The process of rehabilitating the miners is monitored by NASA medic Dr. J. Polk. Because the miners were eating barely enough to get by, probably less than 300 calories a day. In effect, they were starving. What we worry about is something called refeeding syndrome, which can cause a low level of phosphate, which can then lead to cardiac dysrhythmias or cardiac failure. Getting the right nutrition to the miners is critical. Three six-inch bores were drilled during the initial search for the miners. One hit the tunnel outside the refuge. The other two broke through into a tunnel higher in the mine, near a workshop. These six-inch wide holes are the miners' only lifeline to the outside world. Hollow pipes called palomas, or carrier pigeons, are packed with provisions and winched 2,300 feet down the three holes. Medics first send a glucose solution containing minerals and vitamins. It will slowly and safely reintroduce them to food. All of the focus now turns to the engineers. They have only one option to save the miners, to somehow drill a 28-inch shaft nearly a half a mile down through extremely hard rock, lower a steel cage barely wide enough for a man, and then winch them back to the surface. Cheers ring out around Camp Hope. The machine everyone hopes will rescue the miners 
the Strata 950 arrives from a mine 500 miles away. This drill cuts using three rotating tungsten steel discs. First, it will punch a 15-inch pilot hole down to the miners. Then, a second device called a reamer will widen the hole to around 28 inches, wide enough to extract the men. The Strata 950 is designed to drill perfectly straight vertical holes. This will give the rescue capsule a clean shot to the surface. The drilling rig must be placed precisely over its target. This drill also needs over four and a half gallons of water per second to lubricate and cool the cutting bit. But the mine is in the middle of the Atacama Desert, the driest place on Earth. The nearest water supply is a borehole, an hour's drive from the mine. Its water is now crucial in saving the 33 miners. On the evening of August 31st, the drilling begins. horrendous conditions. Inside the tunnels, temperatures reach 95 degrees. The rock walls drip with moisture, and the humidity in the air is a suffocating 95%. Even the darkness poses a threat. We worry about the lack of exposure to uh, UV light, uh, UVA and B. UVA and UVB help kill bacteria and fungus and viruses. Without that, the men are probably more at risk uh, for fungal infections, bacterial infections, etc. in the mind. High doses of antibiotics are passed down to the men to deal with infections. But some miners have long-term health issues. The oldest miner, Mario Gomez, is approaching his 64th birthday and 56-year-old Jorge Gallagios has high blood pressure. Jose Ojeda is diabetic. The fear is that the men's health will deteriorate before the rescuers can reach them. Today, an American-built drilling rig, the SRAM T-130, arrives. It's part of a daring new rescue plan, dubbed Plan B, that started with a phone call from Pennsylvania-based drilling engineer Brandon Fisher. Well, we initially saw that they were planning on taking as long as Christmas. We felt that we needed to get involved and at least reach out and let people know from Chile that we have technology that could possibly help. Brandon's plan is brutal but much faster. Instead of grinding the rock like plan A, his drill will smash it. Compressed air forces a piston to smash into a drill head made of hardened tungsten steel points. These points hammer into the rock 20 times a second. This drill should be twice as fast as the Strata 950, but there's one major drawback. You can't steer it. But Brandon has a plan. Three six-inch diameter shafts run down to the miners. They're supplying the men with food, 
water, and medical supplies. Brandon's bold idea is to sacrifice one of these supply lines. He will use it to guide his air-powered hammer. The Plan B team have designed a special hammerhead with a guide piece on the tip that allows the drill to follow the existing pilot hole. As Plan A continues on, Plan B starts to drill. The first 150 feet of this hole is the hardest. The drilling bit has to change direction steeply at the top as it follows the existing pilot hole. Brandon worries that the hammerhead will jump out of the guide hole as it tries to round the curve. Plan B is a fast but high-risk ride. The speed and economics in most cases outweigh the, the chance or the risk that you take. Psychologists know that if the miners are to survive, they must continue to pull together as a group. When someone is a little sad, the group brings them in and they integrate him, making him better. If someone is angry, he's left alone for a while until the problem goes away. The group has kept a special structure preventing extreme situations from occurring. Psychologists also have to deal with some of the men's addiction to cigarettes. Even though they've been sent down nicotine patches, the miners want to smoke. Their request is denied. The air is too toxic. To keep the group's spirits up, psychologists show a live soccer match between Chile and the Ukraine. While the families watch above ground, the miners also follow the action thanks to a projector and a half a mile of fiber optic cable. Ex-professional soccer player Franklin Lobos gives a halftime analysis. I think it's a fair result. Ukrainians are playing better than Chile. I hope we can improve in the second half. Clearly, the Ukrainians didn't get the memo. The match ends in a two to one defeat. Half an hour ago, we had a problem because uh, the drill uh, is broken. So we have to put a video camera and see what happened there. The camera reveals a catastrophic failure. Plan B's hammer has disintegrated. It's hit an iron roof bolt close to a tunnel that no one knew existed. Steel fragments are wedged over 800 feet down the pilot hole. Engineers use a magnet to fish out the metal pieces. But all attempts end in failure. Plan B is now dead in its tracks. The miners have been trapped for 35 days. And the strain is beginning to show. Minor Victor Zagovia describes his feelings in an emotional letter to his brother, Pedro. There is no way I'm going to lie to you, how things are down here. Here it's really bad. This hell is killing me. I try to be strong, but it's difficult. Sometimes when I sleep, I dream I'm at a barbecue. When I wake up, I find myself a prisoner in this darkness. Plan B is still out of action. 
After two frustrating days, the engineers failed to clear the blockage. It's frustrating. Uh, it's not a quick process to get back out of the ground. Everyone sucked it up, and we quickly started manufacturing on-site fishing tools, apparatuses to go down and retrieve the broken metal out of the ground. And today brings more bad news. There. The boys are that nervous. They can't hear the machines, they can't hear anything. Then, a newcomer rolls through the gates of the mine. This is the first of 42 massive trucks carrying the pieces of a monster new drill, Plan C. starts at a seven degree angle. It will aim for the workshop above the miner's refuge. For the miner's families, the rise of this 150 foot tall, super fast drill is a reassuring sight. Supposedly this machine can do 100 meters a day, so it would be much quicker as long as nothing goes wrong with it. Our hopes are with Plan C, the transformer, the big one. But this monster will take nine days to construct. After five weeks underground, individual personalities begin to emerge. Most noticeable, is Mario Sepulveda, who has become the group's stand-up comic. Ah, and one message. The wives who raise the money of their husbands, it's time they pull their socks up and understand that we don't earn our money because we are prettier than our boss. No, we earn our money with the sweat of our bra. Plan B has been out of action for five days. All attempts to lift the broken drill bit out of the hole have failed. A piece of the head of the hammer is uh, down there, so we have to try to take it out, which is not an easy task, and we have tried twice, and we haven't been able to do it. If engineers can't remove the broken drill bit, they will have to abandon the hole and start again from the surface. When you are in the drilling business, you know, you drill a hole, and if you lose a hole, then, then you lose money, you know, but, but if you lose the holes here, you can lose lives. Starting over will put Plan B's rescue attempt back by at least nine days. It's a desperate and frustrating time for the families at Camp Hope. Tonight, one of Chile's most sacred icons, the Virgin Maria del Carmen, is brought up to the camp. As the families pray for the men, 
engineers make a last desperate attempt to repair Plan B. Virgen del Carmen Bella. They're using what's called a spider, a metal tube with teeth cut into its tip. It's lowered down to the bottom of the hole. As it approaches the obstruction, it's pushed down under immense pressure. This forces the teeth to bend inwards, enclosing the metal debris. Engineers wait to see if their spider holds on to its catch. It works. Plan B can finally begin drilling again. Plan A is also back up and running, its maintenance complete. But so far, it's only averaging 66 feet a day, and this is just the pilot hole. At this rate, the miners will remain buried underground for at least another four months. Nine days longer than anyone in history. Psychologists credit the men's resilience to one thing, their faith. Faith plays a key role in maintaining your motivation to survive. It's the understanding of the people who are trying to rescue you that they are technically good, that they are working 24-7 on your behalf. Keep encouraging you, and you will keep encouraging them, and faith in yourself and in your religion. And without those, they lose the ability as a team to continue to work toward their survival. Their faith is rewarded. Against overwhelming odds, Plan B's 12-inch drill bit smashes through into an access tunnel close to the miner's workshop. It's 6.35 in the morning. Thank you. Thank you to all our dear colleagues who have worked so hard for us. We are full of emotion for what's been achieved. And with this, we want to thank you, compañeros. Attention, with all our hearts. But in reality, the battle is only half won. The 2,067-foot shaft must now be widened from 12 to 28 inches. Brandon Fisher's Pennsylvania workshop builds a special powerful new drill bit for the task. As the blue drum rotates, its four hammerheads pummel into the ground at 20 times a second, shattering the hard rock. It chews through more than three feet of rock every hour. If there are no setbacks, they could reach the miners in 26 days. September 18th. Today is the 200th anniversary of Chilean independence. Half a mile beneath the surface, the miners are determined to join in. They're sent down a traditional meal of empanadas. Go on, take a bite. But not the red wine that normally accompanies this dish. Alcohol has been banned by the medics, but they've been forced to give in on another issue. And he owes me the cigarettes. 
and that third one owes me a pack now. It's going up. For the past six days, the miners are allowed a limited supply of cigarettes. Assembly of the massive Plan C rig is finally complete. Its 28-inch tricone bit is powerful enough to dig the rescue shaft in just one pass in only 20 days. Mining Minister Goldborn switches on the rig. We are going to start the drilling with the oil rig in a second. Water-based slurry cools down the three interlocking drill heads and drives rock cuttings back to the surface. Here we have the debris created by the drilling. Now, for the first time, all three drills are up and running, locked in a dramatic race. Plan A makes it to 1,234 feet, but it's still on its first 12-inch pilot hole. The Pennsylvania-based Plan B team reaches 279 feet, while the massive oil rig Plan C has reached just 131 feet in four days. The rock is harder than predicted, wearing down the drill heads. Each one lasts approximately 20 hours, it takes 12 hours to change out each bit. And then, Plan B suffers its second catastrophic failure. And this time, there's no hiding it from the miners. One of the drill's four hammers breaks and drops down the pilot hole, crashing into one of the tunnels. Good afternoon. Could you please explain? What is this little thing you've got? I think uh, it's called the drill bit, but could you explain why this bit is here? Instantly, they were on the telephone, called us to let us know there was a bit in the hole. The only time in my life that I've ever drilled a hole that we have communication below that tells us what's going on. The miners joke about the accident. But as their 50th day underground approaches, they don't know how much longer they can survive or whether they'll ever see sunlight again. For the families of the 33 miners, it's a painful waiting game with hopes raised and then dashed. But today, day 52 brings an exciting development. The escape vehicle, dubbed the Phoenix, arrives. It's been specially designed by the Chilean Navy with help from NASA. A narrow 21 inches in diameter, it's painted in the colors of the Chilean flag. Led by Minister Goldborn, the families are given the chance to experience what awaits their loved ones. Every day that new equipment arrives, we are the closer to seeing them again. Anything that arrives like the capsule tells us it won't be long. That day will be out very soon. Inside are oxygen cylinders in case of breathing problems. A mesh door provides ventilation. There's also a mechanism that splits the capsule in two. If it jams in the shaft, a miner can winch himself back down into the mine. If the mechanism fails, there'll be no way to get to him. Day 58. In the race to rescue the miners, Plan B surges ahead. Plan C lags well behind at 656 feet, while Plan B has now reached just over 1,000 feet. Plan A hasn't finished drilling the pilot hole.
To the drillers' disappointment, authorities decide to shut down Plan A. Underground, the miners have work to do. They're battling to clear the buildup of debris caused by Drill B. The miners are working on Plan B every day. They, they, they work on shifts, three shifts, eight, eight hours each shift. We need them to took out the ore that we are putting down with the, with the drilling process. We are talking about almost like 20 tons each day. Those three shifts do the job uh, at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Okay, and they, they use a, a charger and they took all the material and put it in, in, into a gallery, which is uh, 200 meters distance from the place where the material is going down. October 5th, day 61. At Camp Hope, supporters of the 33 miners gather on a hillside above the mine. They're holding a vigil to mark a solemn milestone. Today, is exactly two months since the San Jose mine collapsed. The families pray that rescue is just days away. Plan C is proving to be a disappointment. It hasn't even reached halfway. The rock is so hard, it's only chewing through about 50 feet a day. But there's good news. Plan B is close, reaching 1,528 feet. Once finished, drillers will reinforce the weak rock at the top of their drill shaft with steel lining tubes. They cannot risk a tunnel collapse while a miner is being winched to the surface. The rescue team begins practicing their mission. A crane lifts the capsule into one of the steel liners. It's an extremely tight fit. Each man will spend nearly 20 minutes in this cage, alone for the first time in over two months. The final journey to freedom will be grueling. We see that the yellow top is now completely inside. It's dark in here, but I have light, so I'll see everything. Day 65. The sun rises over a freezing Atacama desert. As day breaks, Plan B is only 10 feet away from the miners. It's a dangerous time. The rock directly above the tunnel roof is weak. The threat of major collapse is very real. We're going to take our time going through talking to the miners. They'll be telling us what they're seeing down there. Uh, everyone's just completely pumped up right now. They've reached the final few feet. Now they're drilling at half speed, inching toward their target. 8 a.m. Brandon Fisher's specially designed drill smashes through to the miners. Best drillers I've ever seen. This is the 33rd day that we were drilling. 33 days, 33 miners. I just can't believe we're finally here. It's just, I, I don't even know what to say. I'm, I just feel like I'm ready to explode. After 65 torturous days underground, the Plan B team gives the miners their escape route. This is the hardest job I've ever been on in my life, technically and obviously emotionally. And uh, it fought us the whole way. They really fought us the whole way. And, uh, 
there's a lot of times we didn't think we'd make it. At the very end, you probably saw the, the pipe jamming. The roof bolts were catching in the teeth. And, you know, it's like, oh, great, we're not going to be able to make it. But, uh, yeah, we made it. Mission accomplished. The Plan B team leaves. They know the celebrations ahead belong to the families who've waited so long. I made a bet on Plan B. And Carola? I made a bet on Drill C. I had a lot of faith in Drill C because it seemed much faster and all. And I lost. There's fear, too. No one knows how the men will be affected by their long ordeal. The only thing I want is to see him and hold him. But at the same time, you understand that at times they will want to be alone. And that is something we'll have to respect. Because they've been alone for a long time. They have gotten used to another way of life. We'll have to start from the beginning again. In the early hours of day 69, the final phase of this ambitious rescue mission begins. Medics decide that a few strong men will lead the way in case of problems followed by the ill and weakened miners. Florencio Avalos, the first to be filmed alive, is the first to leave. As he's winched up at a speed of three feet per second, his wife, Monica Araya, and seven-year-old son anxiously wait alongside Chilean president Sebastián Piñera. Just after midnight, the capsule breaks the surface. The cage door is opened, and Florencio is a free man. Next to emerge is the group's energetic spokesman, Mario Sepulveda, armed with souvenir rocks. Seventy days ago, what looked like a horrifying catastrophe has become a miraculous story of technological ingenuity, camaraderie, and courage, witnessed by the entire world. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the following. Exxon Mobil taking on the world's toughest energy challenges. And by David H. Koch. And... Discovering new knowledge. HHMI. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.